Welcome. I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and this is the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode 125 of the Deeply Rooted Podcast. We thank you guys for joining us wherever you're at and however you may be listening. Thank you so much for supporting what we're doing here at Deeply Rooted. Don't forget to subscribe and send us a review on our platforms at YouTube and on Apple Podcast. If you head on over to our YouTube channel, you'll find all of the archived episodes on there. So if there's something you've missed and want to go back and check out, that'll be the spot to do that. You can also find us on our website, that's deeplyrootedpodcast.com. Again, that'll take you directly to our YouTube link if you'd like to listen to the episodes. We've also got our blog post on there and upcoming ministry schedule. And that leads me into our next topic. Be sure to go ahead and register for the upcoming Deeply Rooted Conference that we're going to be hosting again. This will be our second one. This one is going to take place November 10th and 11th in Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh, this year, we've actually picked out the topic on the Doctrine of Assurance will be our theme for the entire conference. We're really excited to be bringing in a few extra guest speakers this year and some ones we had last year that were fantastic. Brother Mike Abendroth will be coming in from Massachusetts. He will actually be our keynote speaker and having a couple of sessions there himself to be speaking. He's got some fantastic material on the Doctrine of Assurance that you can check out on HETV or his recent book that he has published as well on the title of Assurance. So be sure to check that out maybe ahead of time and brush up on that doctrine before you get to the conference. But again, make sure that you find your way over there to get some tickets ahead of time. Anybody under 18 is getting in free, but we do ask that you go ahead and register so we can go ahead and count heads for everybody that might be attending. We've also got Brother Josh Banks, Greg Sircone, Vern Hall, Damon Joseph, Sean Morris, David Rossetti and myself will also be preaching at the conference. We'll be in different sessions. Some of those might be a little smaller than others and maybe some breakouts. Should be able to also provide uh, lots of material like we did last year. We had a lot of great booths that we were setting up and a lot of good material for people to choose from and a lot of good fellowship as well. So it should be a good time. Again, that's November 10th and 11th, Kingsport, Tennessee, for the second Deeply Rooted Conference on the Doctrine of assurance. Now, having said all that, we want to go ahead and get into the meat of the matter here as we're recording. I'm pleased to have a new guest on with us, a gentleman I've got to know over the last year or so, particularly right before our last conference that we had. But this is Brother Dave Reynolds. Uh, Dave is a husband to Hillary. He's a father of three. He's an elder at the local master's church here in Kingsport, Tennessee. He's also authored multiple books, and Dave currently resides in Churchill, Tennessee, and I say that because we're probably going to get into the background that this man has traveled much of the United States. So, Brother Dave, thank you for being on the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Thank you, Bill. It's good to be here. Tell us a little bit about your most recent book. I know you've been uh, talking a little bit about this on your own social media platforms, and at our last conference, you were able to kind of get the word out about this and showcase this to people. So, uh, what is it that you've written, and, and why is it so important, do you think? Well, kind of in my wheelhouse, if I've got a wheelhouse, um, I'm really into eschatology because I hate mystery. <laughs> I like to, you know, I like to resolve things, and, and that's a topic that doesn't get covered much in churches except for um, in some churches that have a lot of bad information and spread a lot of bad information. Well, I wanted to get down into the nuts and bolts of how the end times work biblically. And there, there came a point in my life where uh, I literally sat down at the dining table with a big, huge piece of uh, butcher paper and tried to line out according to some of the charts that I'd learned so many years ago. And some of it just didn't wash. And I thought, wait a minute, this doesn't work right. So I Erased some, threw some away, tried again, and, um, you know, just really started trying to assess this out and trying to figure out exactly what the Bible teaches as opposed to what I learned in Sunday school and and so forth. So um, what ended up happening is that 
um, more recent years, when I moved out here to the Kingsport area, word kind of got out that, hey, Dave is really into um, end times prophecy. So people would ask questions. And then um, opportunity came up at a church to uh, teach a protracted series on the end times, on eschatology. And it was at one of the local churches during Awana, and they didn't want the parents to have to drop off the kids, go home for two hours, and then come back. So right. these classes for adults. So um, I, I uh, taught in that class, and, and by the end of the course, people came up and said, hey, we want to do more. You know, is there any chance you're going to be teaching more? And I thought about it and thought, well, I can let me get your information, and I'll, I'll reach out to you. And um, so we decided to do the book of revelation and do it in my home and invite some people out and it was it was pretty crowded and people even brought their kids surprisingly enough um the kids were engaged they're laying all over the living room floor and they're engaged <laughs> the most we had in one evening was 19 kids wow and uh during the bible study they were they were engaged i was kind of concerned about some of the material and their comprehension or whether some of it was scary but no they did uh you know they were they were engaged so it was fascinating so this has happened a couple times over the years, and somebody else at one time said, "You know, you should write a you should write a uh, commentary on the Book of Revelation." And, you know, there's a, a bunch of those out there, and yeah. some are better than others. And I wasn't really excited about doing that. Meantime, I had written a fictional novel in the past and self-published, and in the interim, I had also pulled together a book that was a nonfiction. And it was a bunch of papers that I had done, you know, Bible college, seminary, and so forth, and kind of reworked the material and put it into one thick book. And uh, I had all that material. So I prayed about it, and I thought, you know, I, I, I should do something, but I don't want to do your common every day. I mean, that's kind of, for most people, I think, reading commentaries, unless you're very engaged, it's like watching paint dry. People don't, <laughs> people don't usually sit there and just read through a commentary. Even when we're teaching, we'll, we'll turn towards sections and we'll, you know, pull out material out of that section, but nobody's going to sit there and, and read. But I wanted something that was going to be easier to read for John Q. Public or might even be a witnessing tool or whatever. And we know about Left Behind series, how it did, and, and I was never real excited about the writing style and some of the material and that, but it sold many tens of millions. So people are interested in the topic. So what I decided to do was I decided to write something that I call a living commentary. In other words, it's, it's kind of like what Jesus did with parables, right? And he would instruct and he would instruct through story. So we have this pattern in scripture of instructing through story. So I got an outline, you know, the book of Revelation, if you want to take the book of Revelation as what goes on in the very last days. Um, I decided to take some characters from that earlier fiction and they find themselves at the beginning of the book of Revelation in uh, the tribulation week. And they find themselves in trouble, and um, some become believers, and some become believers over uh, gradually over time. Uh, so we're dealing with that and how they deal with the material, and they're asking the questions, well, what's going to happen next? What happens now? What are we supposed to do? What does the Bible say? What is, where do we look? They have some material from somebody who um, is missing. You know, she was raptured. They have some material because she had been witnessing to a couple of them. So they start to take some of her notes and things that she had left behind and stand this and having discussions. So what happens is we go through the book of Revelation and go, well, wow, look at this. looks like here we're, we're at, you know, the sixth seal. What does this mean? Because we've had this happen. We've had this happen. What's supposed to happen now? Well, sometimes they disagree and they say, I don't think it means that. I think it probably means this, don't you think? It means this, no, and then there'll be other times when they don't know. And they, they simply say, I don't know, I guess we'll find out when we get there. So they deal with these issues as it comes, and so it's very 
um, like conversations that you and I might have when we're reading through and we're having this discussion. Well, how do you understand this? You know, um, and there's even some of the discussions. Well, you know, we can't really. I can we really understand what it means because this is supposed to be apocalyptic language. Well, what's apocalyptic language? Well, the apocalypsis. It means a revealing. It's not a hidden language. It's not the obfuscation of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's where he's revealed, and it's it's not intended that the book is confusing and full of nothing but symbolism that we can't possibly understand, because why would God, why would he even bother writing or having John write it if we're not ever intended to understand it in the first place? Right, right. So there's a way to understand it. So they go through and they have these discussions, and they might find some things in the Old Testament. They might find themselves in Matthew 24, all of it, discourse. Meanwhile, they're fleeing, and they're finding themselves in trouble, trying to get out of trouble, and, and they're trying to leave the West Coast, which most people today are anyway, <laughs> and, uh, under much more dire circumstances, because if you live kind of close to a big city and bad things start happening, all those mobs with that mob mentality will leave the big cities, go into the smaller rural areas, kicking indoors, doing whatever to survive, so they're thinking, we, we got to get out of Dodge, we can't stay here. Well, what do we do? So the book takes takes it forward there, and it, it only makes it up to just shy of the middle of the tribulation week, and then I'm, I've got planned a few more books. I'm working on the second now. So. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question. I, I thought you had planned a series. What is the title of the first one that you've written? And the first one is Behold Wrath, and it's... it's um, been published through Virtue Publishing. It's it's available now. Um, they're doing kind of a slow rollout. They can't do as big a rollout as they do sometimes with other books because, um, you know, we, we had this discussion. Books these days and what distributors and marketers want to see is they want to see people with a huge social media following and the Instagram and, and uh, lots of Facebook and lots of YouTube following and stuff. And, you know, I'm... I'm an old dude. I don't, I don't have a lot of uh, social media stuff out there, and I don't do the Instagram thing and, and all of that. So um, so it's a slow rollout, but it's out there. And uh, just play it by ear. I'm just trusting the Lord for how it happens. The gospel's shared in there a couple of times, so Behold Wrath is, is out there, and it's, it's available. It's getting good response um, for the most part. Um, and... The second book will be um, "Behold the Beast," okay. and that's going to be pick up in the, mostly in the middle of the tribulation. And then um, by the time we get to the end, we have "Behold the King," and I'm not real sure I'm going to handle that because that's going to have to be, you know, really truncated. There's a, a lot in the scripture we don't just simply don't know about the millennial period, except in general terms. Jesus sits on the throne of David and he rules. Okay, what does that look like? So there's a lot of things we know about it, but how do you portray that with characters? So that's going to be, I might need a lot of prayer for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be sure to do that for you. Uh, any previous writings you want us to know about? Any other books that uh, you're pretty proud of? Well, the one that, um, that was a fiction beforehand, it was completely self-published, was called Shift, S-H-I-F-T, and it's some of the same characters, and it's completely, really the gospel's shared in there, but it's, it's, um, it's just a, you know, a, a, a paranormal thriller, and, you know, my, my policy in my mind as I wrote that is, is come for the thrill, leave with the gospel. So I wanted to do this thing that's kind of, um, uh, People have compared it a little bit to um, Dean Koontz novels, and um, which I think is very complimentary because he's a very popular, enduring, um, excellent writer with what he does. And um, but the gospel's in there, and so I wanted to use it as kind of an outreach thing. I, the nonfiction that I did was. Um, Prophecy from now on, and it's well over 400 pages, lots of charts and graphs, and all that kind of stuff. And it's available out there too, you know, Barnes and Noble and Amazon and all that good stuff. Um, and it had a good run for a while there in its category. 
on the Amazon bestseller list. So um, I was happy with that. Gotcha. Hey, I'm a school teacher, and I want to ask you this because you're a writer. What's your biggest pet peeve when you see other writing? Oh, goodness, my biggest pet peeve. That's hard to tell, hard to say. Um, I don't know, I'd have to really think about that. I'd have to really think about that. Um, give me five minutes. Let's move on and ask me again. I get very frustrated <laughs> when I see people really butchering the your and the Y O U R, oh, or the daughter, apostrophe R E. I get really frustrated when I see that. Or when people write the wrong there, and there's about three different ways to do that. I don't know why, but that runs all over me. But I thought you might have a pet peeve in particular. Yeah. Well, I, you know, if anything, I, I would say it's still the dialogue. You can go too far and, and um, write dialogue that is too casual and, um, too cultural to where you could get all this playing in there, you almost can't read it and understand it. You can go too far. Yeah. But most of the time, it's editors edit it to death and make it sterile, and it's really, it's not believable. So um, help me suspend my disbelief. You know, make the dialogue really work. Make it realistic for me, because otherwise I, I can't, I don't have a buy-in. Hey, let's pivot here and talk about you personally instead of your writings explain to us because you're not a native of northeast tennessee tell us a little bit about where you were born and raised i was born in southern california I, my folks lived in buena park about three blocks from knott's berry farm if anybody's familiar with what knott's berry farm is you might have seen knott's berry farm jellies on the shelf at the supermarket but <laughs> that's where it came from but beyond that unless you've been out in that area you might not know it's kind of a theme park but mr and mrs knott were um, christians and uh, originally, you got in with those carnival-type tickets, and you get to go on a donkey ride, and there were a couple of Ferris wheels and things, and a cable car cafe and things, and it grew from there, and now it's a major theme park. And it's, I, I, what I understand, it's not being run quite as quite as well, but I was out in that area. Um, moved for a couple years with my dad. Um, he worked uh, as a superintendent for a U.S. Steel Company, so he was at the American Bridge Division in Oklahoma for a couple of years, so as a child, I lived for a couple of years in Oklahoma, and I learned what real humidity and sweat was, <laughs> and, um, you know, I have vivid memories of standing in front of the box fan in, in the window and still sweating while I'm standing in front of that box fan. Yeah. There was no air conditioning back in those days for, for us, anyway, so um, then we moved back to Southern California again, and I spent um, the rest of my ute out there in, in <laughs> Southern California and uh, Los Angeles facility. And uh, it's changed a lot. I um, came to know the Lord way back in 1971. To show you what a cadre I am now, it's official. <laughs> I'm 65. So I, it was in junior high and I came to know the Lord in 1971. And um, then um, it was during that time that uh, it was kind of when the Jesus movement was getting rolling out in that area. Yeah, I wanted to ask and, you about that because in a previous episode I did, one of the things we touched on was a bunch of upcoming things for the year of 2023. And one of the things I found fascinating, I ran across this the other day, there's a film coming out later this month for February, I should say. I believe it's February 22nd, if I'm not mistaken. They're going to refer to it as the Jesus Revolution. And it's going to talk about and really biographically look at, you know, Chuck Smith, Lonnie Frisbee, and some of the others in that movement. I think a lot of people on the East Coast may not necessarily be aware of how large this was. And some are. I don't, I don't want a blanket statement that. But I really would love for you to give your perspective on what happened there, because as the film comes out later this month, maybe people that plan on possibly watching that will have a better understanding if you explain what all went down during that time period. 
Very, yeah, I have vivid memories in, of the uh, 60s now. Of course, I was a child in the 60s. Right. In 1969, when Woodstock was going on, I was in the sixth grade. Dad, I had older, two older sisters and an older brother and all their friends. And so I was kind of watching this from a third-hand perspective. But it was kind of, you did see the hippie movement going on and, and um, the clothing and hairstyle changes and uh, drug use was ramping up. LSD was still illegal for a lot of that. But I mean, they, they were literally making it, selling it on the street corners because it was legal. Mm. And experimentation. But you know, it was the peace movement that was rolling out of protests from the war, the Vietnam War. I mean, Vietnam rolled right after Korea, which rolled right after World War II, and people were just done with war. Yeah, so yeah. you had the hippie movement come, and, and people were disenchanted with government and so forth. And folks were still disenchanted, even with the peace movement and how that was going. And it wasn't all the kumbaya that they hoped for and lighting all the incense and gathering up all the flowers didn't, you know, convince people to spray forward peace. <laughs> we're, we're a fallen world, you know, so uh, they didn't realize that man cannot, man does not have a solution to how these things are fixed. So it, uh, I think the, the big thing that happened with Chuck Smith, he came out of uh, the Assemblies of God movement. Um, I actually interviewed him for a series of articles a long time ago. And I wow, went, I didn't know that. Open the material, but I went out there and, and um, interviewed him. I think I was in high school at the time. I was, I was, a, I was kind of pointing headed that way. The other people were out messing around with sports and stuff like that. It's like I'm going to go interview Chuck Smith. <laughs> um, and he was a genuine. He was a, he was a good guy. And he wanted to get out of that movement because uh, of the extreme legalism that he saw. And he saw lots of um, young troops who did not fit the model of coming into church wearing a suit or dressing up really nice in the short hair. You know, if you walked into a church with long hair and one of the hippie kids or something back in those days, uh, you know, you'd get dirty looks and they'd feel uncomfortable even sitting in the back of the church or whatever. But these kids, meanwhile, were looking, they were seeking, and some were looking at Buddhism and transcendentalism and lots of Eastern religious, uh, religions at the time. They were looking at those. And um, some really wanted to know, you know about Jesus and what he was about, and they weren't feeling welcome to church. So I think that might be one of the reasons why, you know, you get out there in California and you got the Hay Ashbury. Um, part of down the Bay Area. Right. And then from there all the way down in the Los Angeles area, the major metropolitan areas, you you had kids who weren't necessarily hippies, but you know, you, you dressed and emulate the way the musicians are at your favorite bands, you know, long hair and the bell bottoms and all that kind of stuff and wearing the vests and and um, it, it, that's not the look for church. But there you are know, people who I won't you know, I say they're they were seeking, but of course, this, I think the Holy Spirit was drawing them, of course. Sure, sure. Because no man, it says in Romans 3, that no man seeks after God. Right. So, uh, when people seek, they're usually looking for a God that looks like them and their view of God, their idea of who God is. And, and who, you know, it usually ends up being a God that looks just like them. Unless the Holy Spirit's drawing them to the genuine article. And in many cases, this was it. That was a movement, and of course, not everybody in there was saved, but it was a movement and it was attracting a lot of people. Chuck Smith um, saw this and he reacted to it, and there were, there were um, major outreach um, activities that they, they uh, laid hold of. They seized these opportunities and had to draw um, Tried to draw the kids in. Um, one of the big things they did is where where Chuck was at was uh, out in the middle of Calvary Chapel. The first one really was a chapel. They're all next to the, the the orange groves and the avocado groves out there in Orange County. 
and they acquired a big piece of land and we got a hold of a big um, three ring circus tent. <laughs> and they pitched that. So that was the original Calvary Chapel church. And um, people in droves were coming in. They, they wanted to hear the gospel. They wanted to hear him in everyday language that the kids could understand, present the gospel. And, um, and you know, if, if you've ever heard Peck Smith agree with all of his theology or not, um, he did verse by verse expository preaching, which even today isn't real popular That's in a true. lot of areas. It's very topical. But he would go through a book, he'd go through the gospel, um, verse by verse, and people were reading it up, people were responding. And I remember um, summer times, um, on some Saturdays, I want to say it was maybe every other Saturday, they would have these concerts. And so friends would come around and, and pick me up in the car and grab all the way out there and um, listen to groups like Children of the Day, Love Song, um, some of these different bands, Much Your Feet, Faith, there's a bunch of them. Eventually, later on, uh, Keith Green showed up. Yeah, yeah. Much later. And uh, so it grew. I mean, it just grew. People were hungry for the gospel. And, and uh, it was in, that, in the midst of that, in 1971, that uh, I came to know Christ. My brother had come to know the Lord in, uh, just about one year before. And his good friend who led him to the Lord, um, came and he'd been sharing the gospel with me off and on. I wasn't going to listen to my brother. <laughs> not much. Uh, that's the way it works sometimes, you know. Prophet's not without honor except for in his own country. Of that's course. true, so, yeah. Um, anyway, I listened to Jay quite a bit, and he shared the gospel. And then finally this one day, he said, would you like to give your life to Christ? And I, by this time, my heart was softened, and I thought, yeah. I would. So we went out front, and I remember when we sat on the front lawn, and, and he told me, just pray, just tell the Lord what's on your heart, and repent, and, you know, and I prayed, carefully, gave my life to the Lord with a lot of joy afterwards. I didn't feel anything big or magical or anything. I just felt like now is the time to, now is the time to change. Now yeah. is the time to get serious about my life, and, and, uh, you know, through the Holy Spirit, I was strengthened to do that because I was painfully shy. Um, did you attend any of the Calvary chapels after that? Were you Did you involve yourself in one of those churches? No, I didn't. Um, they didn't really start expanding right away. Okay. You know, as far as multiplying. It didn't happen for quite some time um, afterwards. Um, what happened, I was really blessed because... The fellow who led me to the Lord, um, Jay Harris, um, he started me off right away with his background was more probably, I want to say, um, Presbyterian in a lot of ways. He, he introduced me to Spurgeon and introduced me to um, all kinds of great writing, showed me how to study my Bible, how to read it, showed me, taught me how the Bible's laid out. He was a good, great mentor. Yeah. And instructed me on how to live as far as how often I should pray and how I should do it and how I should do devotions and and was there to answer a lot of questions and he really mentored me uh, for quite some period and then the, the little Baptist church I was attending at the time um, they were going with their youth group too and they, after an old guy really old guy um, didn't quite know how to handle the kids and know what to do with the kids and so forth. His name was Ray Overstreet, great, great guy, really loved the Lord. But he was really kind of overwhelmed because here's this youth group that's growing and he's trying to figure out how to manage it. His daughter um, was friends, they go went back to school with John MacArthur. And she says, she says, she was going back and she says, I think I know of a young man. Let me find out for you, and uh, maybe you, you could talk to him. So she went and found out, and 
Um, this, this guy's name was uh, Mark Hansen. I don't know where he is today, but he, um, he was being mentored or, um, you know, we say mentor, that's, that's the worldly term, of course, but, uh, he was being discipled by John MacArthur. Wow. And, and uh, he met with the pastor. He was looking for a youth pastor, and so he came in as a youth pastor. I didn't know who MacArthur was, of course, at the time. MacArthur's church, really, Grace Community was just getting going. So this about 1972, 73, about 73, the church was really growing, and there was even a tape ministry by then. And it was starting to pick up and go gangbusters. Most people don't know what tapes are, but cassette <laughs> <laughs> uh, tapes at the time. And uh, it was uh, quickly becoming the world's largest tape lending library. Yeah. So I learned a lot. And, and the Lord was forcing me out of my cell. Um, I found friends who says, oh, yeah, I go to church. Yeah, what church do you go to? I go to this place. It's called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> you ever heard of it? I'm saying, no, what's that? Well, it's this, that, and the other, and we believe this, and, and all kinds of red flags were popping up. Going, that didn't quite sound right. I, can't, I don't know exactly why, but it doesn't sound right. And so, I, of course, I go and talk to these pastors and Mark, what is this? And he was very smart. Instead of giving me all the answers and spoon feeding me stuff, he gave me material. He gave me here some material books by Dr. Walter Martin, uh, and um, he wrote Kingdom of the Cults, which includes like Maze of Mormonism and all these other things. Uh, very valuable material, and he was huge at the time. But anyway, um, he handed me the material and said, "Go learn and go handle it." And um, so then I, I did, and the Lord was using this because I, I would go witness to her, and there was a friend, and she didn't know how to answer me, so she called up. Next thing you know, a couple of elders were showing up at her house. <laughs> so now I'm trying to answer some elders, and next thing you know, is they get, they get a bishop on the phone. And, um, yeah, can you come over Thursday? Bishop Pelso is going to be here. I'm thinking, what in the world am I? What have I got in the <laughs> and uh, so I go to Mark and I said, Mark, I've, you know, this is crazy. I don't even know what to do. Can you come over and talk to this guy? And he goes, no, he says, the Lord's given this to you and you've handled it up to this point. You've done well. The Lord's put this in your lap and uh, you just handle it. If you don't know the answers, this time you don't know the answers, but you know how to find out. And you come back with them later. He says, if I go and I go talk to this bishop for you, and they go and they go get somebody bigger to talk to me. Well, what do I do? Do I go and get MacArthur to come out and talk to them? <laughs> so let's make this in your lap, so you need to do it. So these kinds of situations kept coming up, and I was in high school by the, this time. And I had teachers from, you know, a teacher who was a pantheist. I had another teacher who was a Mormon. Um, I had um, teachers from every possible stripe, evolution and things. And, and frankly... I got to a point where I came out of my shell and I started getting really cocky, unfortunately. Um, paid stage, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I go into the classroom and I got my Bible on my desk and I'm sitting at the front desk and, and um, I wasn't always careful like I should have been back then. And um, I talked to folks and it was really, it was really nice to, um, have other students respond and say, hey, Reynolds, you said this, you know, how do I, you know, what do you think about this over here with, you know, the Neanderthal man, is this true, and what about this, and so I got to answer, and I got to witness and share Christ, that was awesome, but one of the most humbling things that happened was, I was I was looking, and I was making a commitment to, in every situation I was in, in every class, looking for opportunities to witness, to use my time in there for the gospel. Um, one of them was a piping class, and we had actual typewriters. This is the 70s. We did not have computers. <laughs> the PRS-80 wasn't even out yet, if you want to think about that one for a while. So uh -oh. there was no, no computer sitting on the desk back then. So it was typing. So I thought, what should I type? I'll type. You know, we had free time. The teacher would say, Mr. Farner would say, 
type anything you want for the next few minutes until the end of class. So I started piping the Book of Romans. So by the time I got through about chapter three or four, I was used to confrontation with teachers, especially in the science classes. This one was a little bit different. And I hear, Mr. Reynolds, can you come up here, please? And I thought, oh, here we go. I'm being called to his desk. Let's see what happens. So I was called up to his desk, and he didn't look at me at first, and he's kind of thumbing through these papers in front of him. And he goes, I don't know if you know this or not. And he's kind of quiet. He's kind of choking back a little. And he says, but I used to be a minister of God. Wow. And you could have hit me over this, in the head with a stick. And I'm sure. I would, that was... You know, couldn't have been any more knocked out than I was at that time. And um, he looked at me and his eyes were kind of watering. And he's just nodding. He says, I just want to let you know I really appreciate this. This means a lot. Mm. And I walked away deeply humbled, realizing it's not about me. It's not about me being, uh, getting brownie points or whatever, checking off the list. Look what I, look at the piece that I put down a peg, whatever. And um, that changed my life probably more than that guy's life. So, uh, you know, it's, the Lord does these things to humble you, to shape you into, you know, who he wants you to be. So that's that era. That's the whole 60s, late 60s into the 70s era. And uh, a lot of people were going through similar types of things. We ended up with, uh, on our campus, we had um, a Christian club called the Salt Company, and we met in the classroom, and, and just uh, dozens of kids would meet in there for a lunchtime Bible study. Um, I do not know high school today. Mm-hmm. But even at, at that, some parents protested and said, you can't do that in the classroom, separation of church and state, whatever. So the uh, school counselors and the vice principal got involved. No, you guys have to meet now. You can meet out on the grass somewhere if you want, but you can't meet in the classrooms anymore. So we, at first, put that as something bad, and then we started meeting out on the grass in the, in the quad area, you know, with guitars to do some songs and do some Bible devotionals, and we grew even more because people started wandering over to see what we're doing and sitting down and watching and listening, and we grew even more. So the Lord was using that. Then they tried to say, um, you guys aren't allowed to do that anymore because... You know, any time you meet with a group of four or more people, you could be a gang. Wow. And they kind of pegged me because to be the spokesman because I was kind of the vice president of the club at the time. And uh, the guy who was the president says, oh, Dave, go talk to him. You know, I don't know, if, you know, what we should say, but go, go find out what they want to do. And they said, you know, you guys can't meet anymore. I said, you know, really? So we're a gang? We're going to beat people over the heads with our Bibles? Or, or what are you saying here? So then we reminded and they let us go ahead and, and continue to meet. But it was kind of that tone, you know, satanic attack, um, even back then, yeah. early on. Did you further your education after that? Did you go into college, or did you try to get yourself involved in the workplace? I did both. Um, I worked my way through college. Um, I was the fourth kid. As far as the whole college story goes, my folks were about done by the time I had been around and decided <laughs> I wanted to do some college. Um, I actually started off, I, I did some community college. I also attended, um, there was a, a Brethren Church in Long Beach at the time with Pastor Dave Hawking. Um, and you remember since then, he got himself, himself into a little bit of, um, you know, impropriety with his wife and so forth. And uh, so he had to step back. And this was some years later up in the 80s. But meanwhile, he had started a college, a Bible college. And I I started off there and just kind of piecemeal adding on to it. And over the years, I kept doing this, um, saving a little bit of money, and then, um, you know, a couple courses at Masters, did a little bit of coursework from um, Dallas, you know, and then that good old interweb thing opened up. (laughs) wide open, and, and I saw, uh, I was able to do a lot more coursework that way, and so eventually, eventually I, I got around over the many, many years to finally um, get up to um, a master's degree, and call that good, that doctoral work is, 
you know, that's a, a lot more work that I'm willing to put myself into at this point. Yeah, that's a different sense. animal altogether. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it took it took a lot of years, and, and mostly, you know, I just felt like I've got gaps in my knowledge, gaps in my learning, and every time I tried to take some courses, I tried to pick some courses and and some coursework here and there where I felt like I could learn something, and if it got me at some points that I could add in as far as some credits go, then I just you know keep doing that kind of thing. So, eventually, got my uh, degree through. Um, internet through Booth and Mercy, and then um, yeah, I just said, ah, that's you know, I've gone far enough with that. Not that I know everything now, but no, I'm just been stuck without credits. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about you expanding a little bit. Uh, we mentioned at the beginning of the episode that you are a husband and father of three. How'd you meet your wife? Uh, I met my wife Tori, who just today is having a big birthday. Oh wow! So. Happy yeah. birthday to her. Yeah, thank you. And um, It's kind of funny. I uh, met her through a church when I was living in um, Ventura, California. And um, I was in a, a class that was, I think they called it College in Career Group. And it was um, mostly singles. So of course, they had that feel to it of being like a meat market, you know. <laughs> Maybe people would come in and out and kind of like, what's up with that guy, man? He's kind of, you know, you've probably walked into a couple of those in the past and it was, or at least met some of those people. And, you know, I was in that class and uh, I was one of three or four people who was rotating through teaching. Um, I was always the guy there, so by the time um, I got to be about 35 or so, you know, with a friend had this discussion about maybe I need to move on to one of those other classes now. Because if he says, well, he says, yeah, but you're not just attending here or whatever in, in like a singles group. You're one of the teachers. So, so I said, eh, yeah, okay. I'll give it like another year or so. We'll see what happens. And so I stayed. And then um, in walked with her stepmother was Hillary. And... Actually, I thought the stepmother was the one who was looking to attend class, and I just thought Hillary was just kind of the daughter, you know, <laughs> kind of came up with her because Hillary at the time, I first met her was 20 years old. So do the math, that's 15-year difference. Yeah. So there was no way um, I was looking at her in that way with any prospects whatsoever, you know. But then over time, it's God's little joke. You know, a lot of – the groups would get together after church and say, hey, let's go have lunch. Where are you going? Let's let's go to, you know, Yolanda's, the Mexican food restaurant locally. Let's go there and have lunch. Sure. So we go out to eat. And a group of us would be talking and just visiting and fellowshipping and so forth. And um, the, here and I found we had more and more things in common. We appreciated each other's sense of humor and, and things. And, and um, after a time, she kept dropping hints to me that I wasn't getting Things are literally right over my head. <laughs> and, you know, they come and take an order. For instance, this is one I remember. They come and take an order. And, um, you know, uh, you know, what would you like to eat? I'd like a hamburger. But I said, no onions, though, please. Otherwise, Hillary won't kiss me. That kind of stuff like that joke yeah. around, you yeah. know. And she'd say, have you tried? <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm, ha, ha, ha. I laugh it off because I'm dense. And that's as far as it went. And then finally, it, it took some months later. I, I didn't, wasn't even teen on her exact age, but I remember one time we were, obviously it was the January 30th, we were around her birthday, and I said, how old are you? You know, happy birthday, how old are you? And she says, well, I'm 21. And I'm thinking to myself, no way. <laughs> you know, because this, you know, most people don't know what they're about in life um, until about 25. They don't know where they're headed, where they're going, nothing. So, you know, I told myself, well, if I ever um start dating anybody or get romantically involved with anybody would never be anybody under the age of 25 that's for sure and um that changed though pretty quickly <laughs> over over time um i was on a vacation at one point and we had lunch together and um she had to forcibly sit down across from me and tell me look <laughs> i am attracted to you Moron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only getting the clues. I'm only getting all the hints. 
So I had to walk away and think about that for quite some time, um, you know, for a matter of days while I was away from her because I was on my way to my vacation and I took off to Northern California and then came back later and she's twiddling her thumbs wondering what I'm thinking and I'm, I was grappling with that. So, but anyway, that's how that happened. And so now we are going on, I think, uh, 26 years. It'll be this year um, in February. And, um, you know, like most marriages, you have your rough spots, your learning curves and all that kind of thing. But God, by his mercy and grace, has kept us together and keeps us growing. So, Yeah, amen to that. And congratulations, by the way, on the anniversary coming up. Yeah, thank you. So three kids later, you're married. And how in the world did you make your way out to East Tennessee? Because I'm always fascinated at how people <laughs> from large metropolitan urban areas find their way here. How did that all come about? Well, I feel like I feel like we're pioneers now because we've been out here for about a dozen years, and now it <laughs> seems like it's all a rage. There's a mass migration from um, points northeast and south, southwest out to this area because people are just done with the silly politics and so forth and the uh, shutting down churches and things that have been going on. In fact, walking into the Master's Church, um, you know, it's going to be pretty regular, regular where somebody's coming in. They're from visiting from Maine. They're visiting from New York, and, and they're, they're coming back, and they're coming from Southern California, and they're coming from Fresno. But anyway, um, at the time, I just I knew we had to get out of the area. I wasn't real keen on, on California. Um, I was in San Diego. Um, somebody had wanted to start, because I had this writing bent, wanted to start a Christian production company, but not do Christian films, especially not low-quality Christian films, but wanted to do good entertainment that at least was not insulting to Christians. Uh, content, responsible entertainment. No gratuitous language, no gratuitous sex, no gratuitous violence, just good stories. And so I thought, well, I'm... Yeah, I'd be down for that, you know. So um, I got involved. I had some screenplays already that I contributed. And um, then we looked at others, and we started looking at production. And we started working on funding. We got to a point where we had raised a couple million dollars, and we learned about the whole studio process, about how they, you know, uh, you don't do it the way most Christian companies do it. How they try to raise money with crowdfunding and crowdsourcing just try to, hey, give us money, give us money so we can raise enough money to make this movie. It costs $5 million, we only have $2 million. You no, know what you do is you put that $2 million in for it. This is Reader's Digest Condensed, for anybody interested. <laughs> you, know, you take that, that $2 million that you've got, and you go get on practical attachments, whether it's a, a key director or a good A star um, somebody like that or a top writer that will be respected in the industry, you get them to contractually sign on, if you can get the funding, et cetera, et cetera, I'm in. So you pay them a couple thousand dollars just to have them sign on, you know, as an attachment. So it's a legal instrument. You only go to your director or another star and you say, hey, we've got this director. How would you like to play this role? And you keep adding people on attachments, and that's the studio method. Next thing you know, you might have spent $50,000 or whatever, and you've got all these people who are attacked, stars and directors. Then you go to these film lending arms at banks or sometimes executive producers. And then that they uh, will sign in for distribution and give you the multi millions of dollars you need to make a movie and do it right. So that's the way we were headed. And then 9 11 happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the phone quit ringing. And I found myself, you know laid off unemployed and so we were thinking what should we do california is really expensive anymore we need to really rethink it um her folks at the time were in las vegas nevada they had invited us to go ahead and come out there and stay out there a little bit maybe transition or transition into the nevada area so um we went ahead and did that and while we were there i went ahead and grabbed the very first job i could grab and it was in retail management and um, it's, it's a lot of work. I do not recommend to anybody. That, <laughs> anyway, got into retail, and um, 
started working overnight just to make some bucks. I wasn't going to live off the door forever. So I worked uh, overnight stocking some shelves at a Walmart. And they said, what are you doing working here? Have you ever heard of our painting program? You know, it's really great pay. You can make six figures and all this kind of stuff. So I thought, well, well that's what I'm supposed to do. So I went into the management program. Then I was recruited the way to Bed Bath & Beyond. And Bed Bath & Beyond had stores all over the place. So I worked a couple of years, a couple of years too long, a couple of years at Walmart, doing over to Bed Bath & Beyond. And we were paying about moving. So one of the things that we went into was um, – they used to have it in a magazine, but you can do it online, was uh, Sperling's Places Rated. So it's a survey. And they ask you about what's important to you, you know, education, uh, climate, hospitals. So there's a bunch of different things. You know, you, you have these weighted responses you can give, clicking some radio buttons down. And the same questions might come up again later, but where you get something else. And then it'll tell you your top three recommended places according to what you're looking for and what you like um, that you should live. Well, one of them was in the Washington area, and we knew that was expensive and way too much rain. Right. <laughs> Another place was the Springfield, Missouri area. And uh, I knew a couple people who'd moved out there or who, or who had lived out there at one time or another. And then their place was in the you know, five cities, Johnson City, Kingsport area. Of Tennessee, and I didn't know anybody, you know, out here. So I kind of said, "Well, why don't we just pray about this and let the Lord decide?" And I will put in for transfers in in uh, you know those locations in a couple of stores in those locations, and let's see what the Lord opens up. Well, the Lord opened up an opportunity to move out here to uh, the Johnson City Bad Bath and Beyond, um, and there was a um, a management position out there for, um, you know, uh, co-manager type of thing, codependent manager, <laughs> you know, right? And uh, so anyway, moved out there and started doing that. And um, then uh, it got, that got too crazy and it's politically, you know, not the kind of company that you want to be involved with. And it's very PC and woke now, especially. Mm. And, um, so I left there and dialed it back, and I started running a local um, Salvation Army family thrift store in Kingsport for a while until I just retired out of that after a handful of years. So yeah. it was great to be able to serve the public and do that kind of thing and dial it back and save my blood pressure a little bit. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, after all that, here, <clears throat> I was going to say, after all that, I can't wait to read your next book about Walmart and Bed Bath & Beyond that you're going to oh, be writing. <laughs> What a mess. But. Hey, let's talk about since you got here, one of the big things that you've been a part of, and I mentioned this at the beginning, you are an elder right now at your local church, the Master's Church. Yeah. Uh, we pre we have recently had on the program uh, your all's pastor, Greg Sircone. He did an excellent job in his interview, and I want to piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, from your perspective, how did the Master's Church get started here in Kingsport, Tennessee, and how were you involved in that originally? Well, it's kind of a, it's a, it's another one of those convoluted kind of a strange things. Um, at, uh, a few years ago, um, we had a number of people who were associated with it were really they were involved in um, SBC churches, which you know is most of the Baptist churches around here, uh, Southern Baptist Convention, and disenchanted with um, all the topical type preaching, 30-minute sermonettes, and more and more of them are going toward um, attractional model, seeker-friendly model, yeah. and just in what, and um, got approached through some of these people and through people that my wife was hanging out with and saying, why don't you just, Dave, why don't you just start a church? Started looking around and, and um, didn't look very far where, before I said, well, you know, okay, I'll, I'll pray about it. But you know what this means is this means if you do a church plant, this is fundraising, finding a location, finding people. There's a lot of work yeah. involved. We have to pray about it and see. 
So meanwhile, we started down that road, not really sure if that was going to open up or what, and they're still looking around. And um, then through um, one connection and another, uh, I think I posted something on Facebook on uh, a uh, John MacArthur appreciation page or something like that. Saying, anybody know if, if is anybody else in the Tri Cities area who knows of or is also looking for um, good expository verse by verse preaching, that kind of thing. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, somebody responded uh, and um, he said, um, yeah, I found a guy, you know, we don't, we don't need any, any more churches. He says, I found a guy right here and he's, he's at, at this church. So it was a, a church, a church over in um, Colonial Heights. Now, Greg uh, is more um, doctrines of grace and so forth. And um, the, but the, a lot of the people attending that church just look at that as uh, uh, Calvinism. And in this area, a lot of people, they don't know what Calvinism means, but they know it's got to be heresy because they've been told it's heresy. <laughs> you know, uh, Calvinist means that you, know, you don't have to witness or anything like that because uh, God will just pick them out and you don't do nothing. We, you know, it's, there's hyper-Calvinists that will think that way, but that's not what, you know. Um, so you know, it's it's either one extreme or the other. Apparently, but anyway, it, they were concerned and afraid, and so they started. Um, I was attending there. I was going on about two years there at that church, and about that same time, they were wanting to push Greg out because they were concerned about this because of the stuff that was coming out of his mouth in preaching the Gospel of John. <laughs> you know, which he's just preaching the Gospel of John. Right. So it was Jesus, Jesus saying these things. But they're saying, you're, you're trying to do this. It's, it's, it's what he says right here. It's just, you know, he's preaching the gospel of John. So, um, you know, a bunch of people decided, well, if we're going, we're going with our, our pastor because we like this preaching style and we like expository preaching. So then it was a, a church plan, all right, but it was a different, entirely different kind. And so, um, you know, we, I'm sure in Greg's story that, shared how that went from a, a theater to the um, pouring next door to right. we were at another venue and um, in between, uh, which is used to be a, a, a store, a boutique, and now it's more like a wedding venue type of a place. And then um, recently we had the opportunity, though, to move to the Vio Dobbins Community Center into the Douglas Room. So there's no climate control issues nicer and the chairs are padded and so forth so uh, now we're there for as long as the Lord wants us to be there and uh, you know we are um, about two and a half years into this now this yeah. first plant and it's growing so ironically you mentioned that about the VO Dobbins Center I've actually preached in that venue before years ago ah. so I know exactly what you're talking about I'm, that's good that you're all there that is a good venue and I think they make a great location for right now for you all um, looking ahead, I know you mentioned that you're an elder there. What do you think the future is for the Master's Church, or at least you hope, maybe? Well, I, I know that Greg and I share, we've, we've discussed it before, we, we're, of, we're of the heart of, look, Jesus said, I will build my church. And we just want to do what we're supposed to be doing while we're there. Um, preach the word, equip the saints, Worship the Lord. Make it all about Christ. Make, make much of Christ. Yeah. And let the Lord do the work. And if it grows, it grows. If it's as big as it's supposed to be, then it is. Um, we just want to stay out of the way um, and only apply our hands to the things that we're supposed to do and not come up with new traditions, not be heavy-handed. We want to facilitate the saints. And um, so the uh, a, a bunch of the um, young adults... Um, we're over at our house about a month ago and wanted to meet and get to know each other better. We had a rental facility. You don't get to hang out very long afterwards yeah. and things to visit. So we had them over. Now more of them want to get together. They approached, um, they approached us after church about a week or so ago and said, Hey, we've decided we're going to get together and do this again. We want to get together with more people. We want to see more people show up this time and, and do something. I was great. Where well, you can do this at and just kind of laugh and said, your house. <laughs> so I said, uh, okay. So, 
uh, you know, it's, it's like that. We just want to kind of facilitate and make and where the Holy Spirit's working and moving. We want to be there and we want to try to um, make things happen. But we don't want to do programs or anything like that. We just want to try to see, be sensitive to where the Holy Spirit's moving and we want to be there. Yeah, I love it. I think you guys are doing a great job there in your area. And it's been a real pleasure to get to know a lot of you all that are part of that. I'm I'm really praying for you. I think the Lord's got a good work for you to do there. And we just hope the best for you guys at the Master's Church. And I think if you... Appreciate that. Yeah, just keep plowing down. And uh, I think the Lord's got a, a good work, like I said, in front of you all. So I really appreciate you all being in the area. Glad to have you. I know Greg's from the New York area, you're from California, and I just think that's really special to see people here in this area doing so well. Hey, let's conclude here by letting everybody in on some information and uh, how they can get in touch with what you're doing in the church there. Let's start with y'all's church. I know we mentioned the location of where you all are at, but what about the website, maybe times of service, if people are in the Kingsport area looking to find a, a good gospel-centered church? We have much information on the Masters Church, there's no apostrophe in that, so it's just the Masters Church dot net, not dot com, it's dot net. So we have a, a pretty lengthy statement of faith and and all kinds of articles on there, and you can learn quite a bit about what we're about. And there are links from there on to um, YouTube if you want to catch some um, videos, Pastor Greg preaching that kind of thing, and see if his style. Different churches have different styles, just like different people have different personalities. Churches have personalities, so right. they got to pray, pray about uh, what type of church and style you're looking for and where the Lord would have you serve that you might fit in. So the masterschurch.net, there's also a link on there. We have a Facebook page, but most of what we do to Facebook is, is we have people who will log in sometimes from India or wherever to watch sermons and things, so... It's not a platform that we're excited about uh, earning them a lot of money or anything because of what they stand for politically. But if we're going to use, if we can use that platform though for the gospel, uh, we're going to go ahead and do that for now until something else opens up anyway. But that's mostly what we really use Facebook for is just streaming on Sundays. But uh, there's a link there to YouTube. But there's also uh, um, audio if people are like to just listen while they're driving or whatever. So. There are audio files on the website and all kinds of helpful, useful information. Yeah, I've checked it out myself before. Really well done. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to your all's sermons as well, both you and Greg in times past. And it's a great, easy listen. Audio quality is really good. So I, I think people would really enjoy listening to what you guys have. And again, checking it out. If you're in the Kingsport area or even the Tri-Cities area and you're looking for a good, solid church, I, I can't recommend them enough. Um, what about uh, nine nine thirty in the morning is Bible study. Okay, and and then ten thirty is when our church service starts. Gotcha. So nine thirty Bible study, ten thirty actual worship service. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you personally, let's talk about that for just a moment. If people would like to contact you, maybe, and then order your material as well, the books that you've written, and uh, maybe even read some of your writings right now that you post. Uh, what would be a maybe a good email, and then how might they get a hold of some of this material that you've written? My email, if somebody would like to email me, is is uh, my first initial middle name and last name. So it's E. Doyle, D-O-Y-L-E, Reynolds, R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S, at gmail.com. Um, there is a link that I can provide that could be posted um, in the comments section. But... It might work to do a search for uh, Babe Reynolds Theology Blog. If you Google that, it might come up, and it's a Wix site, and I'm, I'm a miser, so I have not spent the money to have my own um, web address, my own name, you know, davidreynolds.com or anything like that. In fact, that name is so common, I'm, I can about guarantee it's gone. But anyway, uh, so maybe I can provide a link that will be available in comments. But there's... Uh, on that site, there are links to go to Amazon, to my YouTube. I've got blogs with articles on that site and uh, all kinds of other goodies if, if, if somebody's so inclined. So I, I write on a number of subjects uh, that I've written on. Um, of course, there's a lot of eschatology, but there's things on there such as 
articles on divorce and Passion Week and all kinds of things that I've, you know, studied and, you know, whatever I feel like I've consolidated some of my notes and I want to put it in and articulate it in a way in article form. And so I'll just put it there. So just, I don't do it really super regularly. It's just kind of whatever it suits my fancy, I guess. Yeah, we'll definitely be sure to put that in all the links in the description. I know you sent those to me personally. So if you're listening to this and want to get in touch with Dave and again, purchase the material, I'll definitely make sure that we put that in the description. So just uh, scroll on down there and look in that and that'll take you right to it. So Dave, brother, we appreciate you being on. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and meeting with us here online and uh, just a great conversation. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and I appreciate Deeply Rooted and all the things that, that you folks are doing and I appreciate the Deeply Rooted Conference and Justin Bias, all the hard work he does yeah. in, in meeting some of the other pastors and it's, it's such a a wealth and blessing to find other like-minded um, pastors and owners in the area who have a passion for the Lord and the gospel and the doctrines of grace and really want to uh, see it done and done right, you know, as far as getting the, the scripture out there into people's hearts and in their lives on a day-to-day basis. So I appreciate that. Amen to that. I applaud that, certainly. And again, we appreciate you being on. Don't forget, folks, if you haven't done so, subscribe. Make sure you leave us a review on our YouTube channel and on Apple Podcast. Find us on our website, deeplyrootedpodcast.com. And if you'd like to email us, you can catch us at drigw18 at gmail.com. Again, that's drigw18 at gmail.com. And until next time, we love you all, and we hope you have a great week in Jesus. Thank <laughs> you.